Good morning. I'm Richard Aborn. I'm president of the Citizens Crime Commission. I welcome you all. I'm thrilled that there are so many of you here. Um, a particular welcome to new friends. We hope you join us a lot. And of course, welcome to our, our people that are just here for all of our events. And I just so much appreciate that. Um, today is, is, is a bit of a definition of bittersweet. It is certainly incredibly wonderful that the commissioner is with us this morning as he begins his last week as commissioner of the NYPD. It's also a bit bitter, it's a bit sad that, uh, that Bill will be leaving the department and moving back into the private sector. Um, but I wanna, before I get to talk about the commissioner, which I wanna do in a second, I do wanna talk about the transition for a moment. Before I do that, I want to do something that I always do with these, and I love to do, and I love to particularly do it here, which is to give just a very hearty thanks first to Howard Milstein, who unfortunately couldn't make it here this morning. Something happened last night, nothing serious, but he just couldn't make it this morning. And a very hearty thank you to Janet Martin and Fonda and the crew in this room in sea level um, they are just the most gracious, professional, efficient people to ever work with. I love being down here, and I thank you all, each and every one of you, very, very much for all you do, not only this morning, but what you always do. So thank you. So let me, let me talk about transitions for a second, and then let me specifically introduce the commissioner. Um, I've, I've had actually the real privilege, and I say that seriously, to work more closely with the NYPD in the last two and a half years than I've done in the past. And when you get that inside view of this department, you really begin to understand why there is no better department in the country. These are a group of professionals that are at the top of their game all the time, always willing to think about new ideas, always willing to engage with each other and with me at times, sometimes a little heated, sometimes not, but always working towards that right answer. And that's been a great, great privilege. So when the commissioner announced that he was leaving, I know for a fact that the mayor had a bit of a dilemma because there's a lot of talent um, in the upper command ranks of the department. But he picked Chief Jimmy O'Neill as the new commissioner. And I have to say, Jimmy's gonna be with us uh, after he is sworn in, and I don't wanna speak spend too much time talking about him right now because there's a lot to say about Jimmy. But Jimmy was absolutely the perfect choice. He is a superb leader. He will do terrifically as commissioner. And at the Crime Commission, we could, just could not be more happy, Jimmy, but that you'll be taking over for Bill. May I ask you to stand up and just say hello? The incoming commissioner, Jimmy O'Neill. So I'm gonna be very brief. Uh, talking about Commissioner Bratton because frankly it is such a challenge to try and talk about all that he has done uh, throughout his career in policing both in New York and throughout the United States and frankly throughout the world because as you move around the world you hear about him and you hear about the department virtually everywhere you go. Um, in, a, in a couple of public comments I made when he actually announced his departure date I referred to him as the father of modern policing. And I didn't do that in a light way. I thought about that. And in many ways, I think that he really is. Because if you think about what modern policing is, it's really about proportionality, it's about community, it's about effectiveness, and it's about transparency. And that, in many ways, has defined Commissioner Bratton's enormous and, and just endless contributions to the field of policing uh, in New York and in the United States. Uh, we couldn't be more thrilled that he was with us for these last two and a half years, and I'm particularly honored that he's starting his last week with us. He's been a longtime friend of the Crime Commission, a very personal friend, and I'm deeply grateful for that friendship. Commissioner, may I ask you to come up? A man who needs no introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. I first want to start off by thanking Richard, Citizens Crime Commission, certainly, which I've had exposure to since first coming to New York in 1990 as Chief of the Transit Police, back then headed up by Tom Rapetto, and then now transitioned over to Richard Aborn. 
Richard has, uh, apart from being managing partner of a very successful and large law firm, trying to uh, reinvigorate uh, the Citizens Crime Commission, has spent countless hours over these last three years uh, down at headquarters. That I see him as much as I see just about anybody. Uh, he's had all my executive staff meetings, and he's been an integral part of the transformation of the organization over the last three years. So much so that my uh, incoming uh, successor, Jim O'Neill, uh, we've agreed that uh, we are going to give you an immediate raise upon his elevation from $1 a year to $2 a year, okay? That uh, reflective of the just, just the sheer amount of time that you've put into the organization. A uh, Couple of things before getting into my actual remarks that each of you have on the table three documents and one is a report that was issued uh, several months ago. Uh, it was a six month summary of uh, where we were at that time in the department and where we felt we could go forward. Uh, I would encourage that if you want to have a history of what has transpired over these last three years, that this is the document that you could go to. It's also accompanied by uh, a cheat sheet, uh, the Cliff Notes, those of you that are from my generation, and uh, that one is the five T's. Five T's takes that larger document and breaks it down into the five strategies that have been driving and will continue to drive the NYPD going into the future. Continue to drive it because Jimmy O'Neill was one of the creators of the five T's and particularly the component about the new neighborhood policing initiative, the tackling crime T, if you will. So he has ownership of it so that I'm very comfortable that these five pillars will be added to, but they are the foundation of the NYPD of the 21st century. A third document is just a summation of the incredible re-equipping of the NYPD and its personnel for the 21st century that we face in terms of with new threats of terrorism, technology, both its benefits and its uh, components of crime that are so much the business of the NYPD, as well as the police departments throughout the country and around the world dealing with cybercrime, dealing with terrorism. And so technology has been a significant part of what we have sought to do. The five T's speak to the idea that uh, these are all areas that we believe we have made significant gains in the NYPD to the extent that we believe that we are the leading police agency in the country, if not the world, in every one of the five T's, whether it's terrorism, training, tackling crime, building community trust. Uh, the five T's uh, focus on all of those areas with technology, the strong foundation. Because in the 21st century world we live in, without technology, without understanding it, without uh, acquiring it, without leading in its development, you are not going to be successful in American policing. So I'd encourage that you take those documents with you. That uh, one of the documents, the five T's, the cover page, as soon as you open the book, has the nine principles of policing. I think uh, many of you who have attended these sessions with me over the last three years have come to understand how much those nine principles of policing articulated by Sir Robert Peel in 1829 in 2016 have more relevance to the world of today than they did even back then. I was very fortunate in the early 1970s, around 76 or 77, that Bob Wasserman, one of the consultants and mentors who's worked with me for over 40 years, working for the then police commissioner, Bob de Grazia, uh, had invited the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police to Boston to uh, speak to the emerging leadership of the Boston Police Department under Bob de Grazia, a transformational police commissioner at that time. And as a young sergeant, I was invited to that session. And he talked about, I believe the uh, commissioner's name was Commissioner Marx, about the Peelian principles that the British Police Service had based their formation around. And as I read them for the first time, they were just very appealing to me because they were reflective of what I was beginning to experience as a young sergeant, then lieutenant, building a neighborhood policing program in the streets of Boston, in the most crime-plagued areas of the streets of Boston. A program that was so successful in its early days that it resulted in my being elevated from lieutenant to superintendent-in-chief of the Boston Police Department in 1980 to implement that program citywide. A lot of what you're seeing in the neighborhood policing that Jimmy O'Neill is developing here, some of the framework of that initiative in the 21st century was developed there in Boston in the 1970s. 
unfortunately, the fiscal crises of the early 80s in Boston, preceded by the fiscal crises here in New York in the late 1970s, precluded that program from going forward. But the dream of the 70s became the realities in LA and now in New York of the 21st century police departments I have come to lead. And in fact, are the realities of policing today. The embrace of neighborhood policing, the embrace of Sir Robert Peel's nine principles. So if you want to know what I'm about as a leader, as what I believe is a transformational leader, an inclusive leader, and one who is mindful of the importance of police to our society, all you have to do is read Sir Robert Peel's uh, Nine Principles of Policing. As to the time we're together this morning, uh, as advertised, and I want to thank Richard on very short notice that he put together this breakfast, and thank you all for coming on such short notice. Also on a Monday morning, which is always the most difficult day of anybody's work week, we're getting back to work, so to take an hour and a half out of your busy work week at the beginning of the week, I'm very appreciative of that. I will have several opportunities this week to talk about 46 years in American policing. Uh, CompStat later this week, Thursday, my last CompStat that I will attend, having been present for the first one back in 1994. Uh, there'll be a lot of lasts reminding me of a lot of the firsts that I've experienced in policing this week. Uh, Richard asked, is this going to be a bittersweet week for you? And I said, it will be. It'll get more emotional toward the end, more so than at the beginning, and particularly CompStat. And then on Friday, uh, one of my great loves of the NYPD, uh, Los Angeles Police Department, two of the most iconic police departments in the world, not just this country, that I've had the privilege of leading in the 21st century and 20th century for the NYPD, is their traditions, their love of traditions, their embrace of traditions, their understanding of the importance of traditions to the American police profession. And so on Friday, I will have uh, what is called my walkout, where uh, you leave between the ranks of the men and women of the department, many friends and supporters, and with pomp and circumstance and the bagpipe band that they march you out the door, put you into a police car, usually a vintage police car, and off you go. And uh, on Monday, Jimmy will have the privilege of a walk-in that uh, at 2.30 on Friday afternoon, Jimmy will be, Jimmy O'Neill will be sworn in as the next police commissioner for the city of New York. And speaking of traditions, for the first time in over 50 years, the succession will come from within the department. The idea that a member of the department, a proud 33-year veteran, now almost 34, uh, who began in transit police before they merged in 1995 into the NYPD, the transition will occur from a sitting member of the department to police commissioner. You'd have to go back, I think, to Commissioner Cobb's days in the 1960s to have that historical feat accomplished. And it's also a reflection of the trust that this mayor, Mayor de Blasio, who has put great trust in me and my leadership team, of which Jimmy has been an integral part, the support that he has given us in terms of financial, leadership, mentoring, support of everything we have sought, additional police officers, technology acquisition, uh, and neighborhood initiatives, terrorism initiatives, that there will be a continuation, uh, not a seamless continuation. Jimmy is a different person than I am. That, uh, but we believe passionately in the importance of American policing. We love passionately this police department, and we both love cops. I'm using that term purposely because I was reminded of it sitting at the table. Uh, Peter Nobler, who wrote the uh, first book, uh, Turn Them Out With Me, that Peter referenced the first cop stat he had attended when he was uh, writing the book with me. And he said, I was surprised when you used the term to the cops at CompStat that you love cops. And it just did remind me that something that I don't think about because it's inherent in my nature, I do love cops. I really do. I love being a cop. I love the profession of policing. I love what we can do, what we have been doing, and what we're going to need to do in the 21st century. And I should change that from we to you, Jim, because I will be stepping aside from the police profession. My new venture will be almost entirely in the private sector with no uh, real involvement with public policing or public life for that matter. So uh, I've already committed to Jimmy that I will stay out of his hair, what little he has, that uh, going forward, and that uh, uh, basically <laughs> I will be on the uh, sidelines as a citizen of New York. But that love for cops is an appreciation of having been one, having been one for 46 years, because even as I've been a superintendent and a commissioner and a chief, I've always been proud to be a cop first and foremost. And all that stands for, 
I understand their strengths. I believe I understand their weaknesses. I understand their needs. And throughout my time as a leader in American policing, I have sought to meet those needs everywhere I have gone. To meet first and foremost the needs of the cops, because if they're being met, then they're going to be better equipped, more able to meet the needs of the public that we serve. And those needs are the most paramount. But to do that, you require leadership from within the organization. You can have all the outside commissions you want. You can have all the outside pressures on policing to change. And God knows at this time in American policing, there's never been a time, probably more than this time, you'd have to go back to the 1970s when I first came into the business, when there have been more people on the outside trying to reform police, change police, change the culture, change how they operate, but it will never happen without leadership from within. That is the reality of it. It will happen more quickly, it will happen more effectively, it will happen more efficiently when there is an embrace of all that society is seeking to change by those who have the responsibility for that change. And to that end, I think that the benefit to the city of New York at this time, as I lead, is that with Jimmy O'Neill coming in, that there is somebody from within the organization, like myself, is a cop. He talks proudly about it and understands their needs and will fight for them as much as he will fight for the public. He will fight for them when they're right, he will correct them when they're wrong, and he will acknowledge when we're wrong. Because so often we are. And there's nothing wrong with admitting your mistakes, because it's until you recognize that you're making a mistake or that you've done something wrong, how are you going to correct it? So in terms of where we are, where we've been, I'll leave the where we're going to Jimmy. He'll be making a speech here, I think, Richard, within a month or so, in which he'll have the opportunity to lay out his vision and the vision of his leadership team. But where were we? In 1970, 46 years ago, just back from the Vietnam War, I fulfilled a lifelong dream. A dream that's so uh, interesting to me included always NYPD and LAPD. As a young boy growing up in the 50s, early 60s, the influence of television shows that was so much focused on in its nascent time TV on LAPD and NYPD for so many police stories, Naked, Naked City, uh, One Adam 12, influenced by that growing up. Also books, I was an avid reader then and now, and so many of the books I gravitated toward were whether they were picture books, Your Police, which you're all familiar with, which has now become a collector's item. I, I'm now the proud owner of three of them. They're worth a fortune, that, uh, the more I talk about them. But other books, uh, True Blue, Varnish Brass, uh, uh, The Commissioner, a whole series of books that helped to influence me and have me understand policing in this city in LA, even as I was growing up in the city of Boston and began my career in the city of Boston. So the love affair that I had from afar, how often do you get that opportunity to have that love affair uh, uh, basically satisfied? Twice now in uh, New York, in LA, and also to have risen to the leadership of the Boston Police where I began my career. With so much of that, I have my lovely wife, Ricky, to say thank you that uh, the opportunity for, thank you. She gave up so much to allow me to uh, take the LA position, gave up her career so that we could move to LA. And then once again, when I came back to uh, New York, safely ensconced in the private sector, uh, that few years in, the opportunity came once again to have a second bite of the apple. How was, and literally a second bite of the big apple. <laughs> How often does that happen? And Ricky once again uh, supported my stepping back from what we thought was uh, jobs and positions that were gonna take care of us into our old age and the risk of coming back. And you know, could at the second bite uh, be as successful as we were the first time? Success not without failure. The failure in the early 90s was to end up at odds with the person who appointed me and that cost me personally and professionally. I think it cost this department and I think it cost this city the way it ended in 1996. But this time I was much more mature, had learned a lot along the way. One of the things about making mistakes, one of the things about getting knocked on your rear end is that if you're smart, you're gonna learn from the mistakes as well as the failures. And I'd like to think that I have learned from those. And so this last time, this last time in New York, I think I worked very closely with the mayor who was fortunately for me very supportive of the organization. Not intrusive, but intuitive. He has very good instincts about policing, although he's had very little exposure to it, and has been there to support, to guide, 
but he has kept his hands off so much of what's important to a leader of policing, to have the ability to pick your people, put them in the right place, free of political interference, the ability to discipline your people without interference, and the ability to, in many instances, run the place day to day without constantly being badgered from the sidelines, as so many of my colleagues around the country have frequently found themselves, and as I found myself in the 90s. So it's been a different time this time, this second bite of the apple, a bigger chunk, and I would argue, personal perspective, I'll lead history and you to judge just how successful it's been. But as I look back on my career and successes and failures, coming into the profession in the 70s, a time like now of great uncertainty in America, a time of great fear, a time of great fear of the change that was going on, the anti-war movement, civil rights movement, the societal changes that were occurring, so many of those changes that are even now, 50 years later, very impactful once again. Issues of race, we are still dealing with issues of race. Issues of war, we are still dealing with issues of war in far off places. Issues of societal change, extraordinarily societal changes that we are dealing with, whether it's of ethnicity, whether it's of sexual persuasion, so much that was just in its nascent stage back in the 70s, has come full bloom in the 21st century. And I've been able to experience it all over these 45 years in these many positions in many cities and indeed many countries I consulted in. And where we are at this time in 2016 is in many respects similar to where we were in the 70s. But Vicky will tell you I'm an optimist. I get out of bed in the morning, what a great day. And usually, even despite the worst of days, at the end of days, she'll tell you it takes me about 30 seconds and I'm off to sleep. That uh, because I'm optimistic that even if I've had a bad day, tomorrow will be a better one. So that's how I approach policing. That's how I approach thinking about our societal issues. And one of the reasons I'm optimistic as I leave is not only the successes I leave behind, but also how far my profession and how far we as a society have come. Think of it, when I joined the Boston Police Department in 1970, 2,800 police officers, my class of 155, there were three minorities in my class. There were 55 uh, minority officers in the whole city of Boston that at that time was 25% minority and growing. There were no gay officers. There were no female officers. The profession was a profession in name only. We did not have any of the characteristics of what would be described then and now as a profession. But the profession has advanced to where we are, despite our flaws, a profession, truly. Highly educated people leading our organizations. The rank and file of the New York City Police Office today, minimum two years of college, extraordinary psychological and other types of screenings to get on the job. Our training initiatives are unlike anything else in American policing today to ensure that when they get out on the streets, they have all the requisite skills necessary to confront the challenges of today. The department is fast going to a minority majority department. It has openly gay offices. It has openly transgender offices. It has almost a thousand Muslim offices at this time of great controversy around those issues, which unfortunately have entered our national debates. We have an organization that uh, maybe more so than American society itself has transformed ourselves. So as we go forward into the 21st century, as Jimmy leads the organization, as others like him attempt to lead the organizations of policing which are being challenged so profoundly, once again, at the national level, at the local level, by the media, by the political pundits, by so many in the community who are well-intended but not fully appreciating just how far policing has come, that this is a time of great opportunity. Out of crises comes opportunity. I have always sought uh, John Linda, one of the other consultants that works with me, I always used to talk about, if you don't have a crisis, create one. Why? Because you can accelerate the change that you want to see. And uh, John would used to come in from time to time when we'd create a crisis, and it seemed like it was spinning out of control. And he'd come in, and this is, this is worse than worse. And I'd always say, John, it's worse than worse, but just think of when we get it solved, just how much better it will be. So the worse the crisis, the better the success when you finally do address it. So that's how I've approached all of this over these 40 some odd years. And how do I think about my profession? the profession that I've so proudly served. I'm proud of it, proud of the profession, proud of its leaders, proud of its cops, proud of the civilians that work so hard for us. Because I truly believe that we have transformed ourselves internally and in response to external pressures almost more than any other entity in our society. In our embrace 
of diversity, that uh, there's still more work to be done in so many of our smaller agencies around the country. But in our embrace of the idea of transparency, our embrace of rule of the law, our embrace of the importance of policing to the fundamentals of our government, our constitution, that in our constitution, in our declaration of independence, the first obligation of government is public safety. And we are the absolute essential linchpin to all the elements of public safety that are promised in our form of government. That we, like law, lawyers, like medicine, doctors, we are a profession that in many respects describes ourselves as the practice of law, the practice of medicine, the practice of law enforcement. Because we're always seeking to perfect ourselves, always seeking to change, to understand that to do a better job with our patients, our patients are the citizens, our patients are the cops. We need to continually be looking inwardly and looking outwardly so that we can combine the skills that we have inside and the skills that are outside. That we need to be inclusive. We need not to be exclusive. So whether we're dealing with development of community relations, which I, have, uh, I think my hallmark, I would hope, in terms of a legacy issue is everywhere I've gone, starting in the 1970s in Boston, I have understood the intimacy and the importance of collaboration with communities. We serve them, and we need to not make decisions about them without including them in that prioritization. So that first and foremost, that the concept of community policing or neighborhood policing, as we call it in Boston in the 70s, and as Jimmy is calling it here in New York in the 21st century, first and foremost, that collaboration and have collaboration, you have to have trust. You have to have common ground that we can come to to exchange ideas and thoughts and concerns and differences, but you need to find a way to talk to each other, to see each other. And so throughout my career, I have sought to do that. As I look at the different departments I have led, I see each of them in a singular way. In Boston, the formula days in the 70s and 80s were around the idea of a very distressed society. We were just coming out of segregation, not just in the South, segregation of schools and housing in Boston. My first 10 years in Boston was a young cop, sergeant, lieutenant, dealing with the crises and the violence around desegregation of one of the most segregated school systems, one of the most segregated housing systems in the United States. Boston, the cradle of liberty. We weren't the deep South. We were in the so-called liberal North. So I saw the vestiges of that. I saw also the idea of how differences around the issue of war, law, and others were tearing the country apart, and how police could be the catalyst to bring them together. So the 70s were a time of developmental structuring that allowed me to not be isolated within the blue cocoon that so many officers find themselves in, but to break out of that, to be involved in a lot of other seemingly non-police related matters in the narrow definition of what policing was back then. To expand that definition to embrace Sir Robert Peel's nine principles, a much more expansive view. We are the police and the public are the police, and we the police are the public. So about moving in through Boston, then particularly coming into transit in 1990 in this city, the most dispirited police department in America, the transit police in 1990. That to me is always gonna be my most satisfying two years in American policing. The transformation of that department from what was the most dispirited to become the Marine Corps of the three city police departments. At a time when the police force of the city of New York, the housing police of the city of New York, were going through extraordinary turmoil. The transit police were coming together in a way that they never thought possible. Through leadership, through support, through equipping them, through training them, they truly became the Marine Corps. And a police department that, interestingly enough, was one of the few police departments in America whose members were drafted. You couldn't volunteer for the transit police force. Under the system in place at that time, when you signed up to be a New York City police officer, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You go to transit, you go to the city police, you go to housing, and you were there. When I came in at transit, 80% of them polled that they wanted to get out of the transit police. When I left two years later, the results were the reverse. They wanted nothing to do with the NYPD, which they felt was not their equal. So that department was my most satisfying, that one of the roles of a leader is to improve the morale and through morale and equipment, their effectiveness. The turnaround of New York City crime began in the transit city subway systems in the 90s with double digit declines after double digit increases for 20 years. 
And that transformation continued into what I think of as probably one of the successes that I and those that work with me, Jack Maple, who we and own, the late John Timoney, who we just buried, that and so many others that we created through CompStat and through the belief that we, the police, could do something about crime. That we existed, as Sir Robert Peel said in 1829, to prevent crime and disorder. And the disorder component of it neglected and still challenged amazingly in 2016, the ignorance about the uh, issue of quality of life, broken windows enforcement. The basic thing that police do is to maintain order. And the advocates out there that want to do away with broken windows or do away with auto maintenance, that feel that they can totally do away with stop, question, and frisk, they're crazy. They're out of their mind because that is the basic mission of the police. Our challenge is to do it lawfully, can't break the law to enforce it, compassionately, respectfully, and to do it where it's needed. And so much of where the need is is reflected in where the calls come from. 911 and 311. To that end, there are two other documents on the side table as you leave that we did not have enough copies for distribution. One was an earlier report that we did about broken windows policing with all of the cloud maps and all of the documentation. And that was an earlier reinforcement of something I have truly believed in that was articulated so well by Kelly and Wilson in 82. But the later document, one we released last week, which was a very strong rebuttal to the IG. I respect the IG, I respect the role of the outside agencies, but when you have the responsibility to have oversight, you have the responsibility to get it right. And if you don't get it right, I'm going to be very comfortable challenging you and pointing it out where you do not. And in that document, their report, they got it wrong in so many ways. So the rebuttal basically, point by point, disassembles their argument and lays out the essentiality, essentiality of broken windows policing to the crime fighting that CompStat focuses on, to the basic mission that which we exist for, which is the prevention of crime. The 70s and 80s, we measured it on our arrests, our incarceration rates, our clearance rates, and we saw that where that got us. Well, what Jimmy's committed to, what the NYPD is committed to, is the right amount of policing for the patient, the practice of policing. Each neighborhood is different, each person is different. Each borough is different in many respects. So the nature of policing now is precision policing, assisted by our technology, assisted by our relationships with the community, assisted by our capabilities to select and train our officers, and certainly assisted by leadership. Leadership that encompasses some of what Jim Collins in his book Good to Great wrote about. The idea of a leader who is able to, on a bus, get the right people on the bus, get the wrong people off the bus, and get the right people into the right seats. I think throughout my career that I think that's what I've attempted to do. And it's also about the flywheel concept. The idea of a flywheel is very difficult to get moving. You really have to struggle. And one person can't get it moving, but if you get a team, additional hands on the handle, you get it going and get it going and then it takes off. And then you as a leader, the greatest satisfaction for me as a leader is stepping back and watching those people on that bus in those right seats, basically take control of that flywheel and just get that bus moving like hell down the highway. Every once in a while you gotta stop and get somebody off, get somebody on, but you keep moving down the highway and you get off the access lane and immediately you get over to the HOV lane where you can move even faster. So he had it right. Teddy Roosevelt had it right back in 1898 when he talked about the idea of his idea of leadership, was pick good people and get out of their way. Let them do what you pick them to do. I think that's been that my model of policing all my time. And in that regard, I think in every police department I've gone into, that by and large, I got the right people on the bus. Occasionally I had to get some of them off. But I think as I leave the profession, I am pleased as I look at myself in terms of the opportunities that were given to me, that I took advantage of them. And I hope that the opportunities that I was able to present through the organizations that I was involved with those that supported me, the mayors I work with, that we provided great opportunities to so many others to help reshape the American police profession. So as I leave, I leave as optimistic as I was when I came in. Optimistic about the idea of being able to create change, being a realist about the difficulties, being a realist about the complexities, being a realist about the limitations, but not letting any of that 
deter me from the idea that, as Gandhi, the great Indian leader, used to say, to create change, you must become the change you wish to see. Well, if you want to see change in American policing, it has to begin with leadership in policing, supported by leadership external to policing. And the good news for New York City is as I step away, as a citizen of New York, staying here, working here, playing here, and as Ricky and I enjoy uh, a little more freedom, that we will in fact feel very good about this city because we know the leadership that has been left behind and that leadership is second to none. Thank you for your time with us here this morning. Commissioner, thank you so much. Um, the commissioner has time to take some questions. If I can just ask the press to let our guests go first, and then we'll, we'll go to the press. And if you would stand up and say your name and speak loudly, we would appreciate it. They're always, they're always a shy group in the morning. No one? David's smiling. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm David Conlon, and I just wanted to, uh, first of all, congratulate, I'm sorry, Congratulate you, Commissioner, on really remarkable uh, two times in New York City as well as a remarkable career. And I just would love to know uh, if you would comment on the role of the Citizens Crime Commission. You've seen it under several different hats. And uh, I, I, would be, I think as you leave, it's important for those in the room to hear your perspective mm -hmm. as a commissioner. Well, <laughs> Inasmuch as the, much of the leadership of and the supporters of the Crime Commission are here, uh, Crime Commission is one of those outside influences I talk about. The idea that uh, I certainly throughout my time, going back to 1990 when I was first exposed to it, Tom Rapetto and the many breakfasts I would attend uh, at that time, that provided the forum for police, law enforcement, the DAs, the criminal justice profession to come and meet with academia, come and meet with the business and community uh, leaders. So it provided that common ground I talk about and continues to do so. And I would argue that as I've watched Richard over these last three years intimately because he's, he's I think he's in my office more than I am, that uh, in what he has tried to do, both with these meetings, but also uh, he's been very engaged in the issue of gun violence and that's where he and I first met so many years ago when I became in the 90s kind of the face of American policing, supporting that initiative, Richard has continued to fight out, fight for the issue of sanity in our gun control laws and has continued to lead that charge here, excuse me for that uh, going off, and recently uh, helped to bring about a phenomenal reform, the idea of the gun courts, that we're only beginning to see the benefit of those. So in his role of head of the Crime Commission, uh, he sees you not as just an, op an, an entity that brings people together, but as an entity that can help to create change that is beneficial in the law enforcement and criminal justice community. So I cannot say enough about it, can't say enough certainly about, about uh, Richard, and, uh, but this is one of the outside influences I think that has uh, significance to me and has had for 25 years. Okay. Uh, the esteemed judge. Good morning, Your Honor. Your Holiness. Yeah. Court's in session. All rise. <laughs> Commissioner, on September 12th, where do you see the department's anti-terrorism fight going? Okay. Thank you for that question. In the, uh, the five T's, you'll see one of the five T's is terrorism. And the terrorism initiative, if all the five T's, are like any piece of architecture, are designed to be linked together, and each piece strengthens the other. So our counterterrorism and intelligence efforts are strengthened by the first T, the trust, that we need to, our Muslim community, our minority communities, our law enforcement communities, we need to have seamless relationships wherever possible so that there is trust to share information. Because police are only as good as the information we either gather that's given to us or that we find. So the trust component is an essential link, linkage between those five T's. Training absolute necessity 
to train our officers how to deal with active shooters, to train our officers how to deal with radiological threats, how to train our officers to deal with the myriad of issues that we now find facing us in the 21st century world of terrorism. On the technology, no department in the world is better equipped with technology than we are. Our average police officer has more technology in the palm of their hand, on their belts, and the training they receive than any place else in the world. I defy you to find any place that is committed to doing more than that than we do here. Why? Because we do remain, unfortunately, the number one terrorist in the target in the world, we believe. Our federal colleagues believe that. And why is that? Well, fortunately, we are the greatest city in the world today and will remain so going forward. But we epitomize everything that they, the terrorists, the myriad of terrorist groups hate. So we need to recognize that. In terms of the idea of our tactics, the uh, crime reduction efforts that uh, Jimmy has been imp implementing through these last several years are focused on the linkage between so much of common crime and terrorism. There was a study done a few years back showing that 60 to 70 percent of the detected terrorist threat attacks in the United States were detected because of, see something, say something. Somebody saw something that they reported to the police, and increasingly our police are more attuned to see something through the prism of terrorism as well as through the prism of crime. So where are we in New York City? We are where we need to be. We are prepared. We are the best prepared in terms of our intelligence gathering and our counterterrorism measures to prevent, but we are also, I believe, the best prepared because of the resources we've been given particularly during this time by this mayor and some of the district attorneys with the monies that I've received from District Attorney Brown, from uh, uh, District Attorney uh, uh, Cy Vance here in Manhattan, their forfeiture monies, tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars for the technology to help us to detect and prevent. But if there were to be an incident with the new units that we have, the 550 person critical response command, those officers you see all over the city with the helmets and the long guns, they didn't exist a year ago. They exist now. Why? Because ISIS didn't exist two or three years ago, and it is now the most significant terrorist threat in the world today. So we had to respond to that new threat. We have the 800-person strategic response group that didn't exist a year ago. In response to the large-scale demonstrations that we saw, after the horrific events of 2014-15, the murders of our police officers, we saw demonstrations of a type we'd never seen before. 21st century demonstrations that were being formed, guided, and moved around through technology. So anybody can call for a rally at any point in time and gather hundreds of people very quickly. And we need to be able to monitor that happening so we can get our forces there as quickly. But we need to also have not only technological mobility, we need to have uh, other types of mobility. So the old adage, everything old is new again, you're going to start seeing hundreds of New York City police officers on bicycles. Because Jimmy O'Neill is equipping that SRG with hundreds of bicycles that they will take to demonstrations. They serve as barriers if necessary, but most importantly, they allow the officers to move very quickly, to stay ahead of the crowds, to be more, much more mobile. So it's fascinating. In 2016, we're going back to where Teddy Roosevelt was in 19, 1897 when he introduced bicycle patrols to the city of New York. Everything old is new again. So where are we with terrorism? Uh, it's going to be with us for years to come. That uh, The likelihood of with uh, the technology we deal with, uh, they're not going away, and we can't ever go away either. But what we can do is reduce the threat to an awareness rather than a fear. And that's where I think we are at this time, that we should not be fearful in this city. I am not. I'm the police commissioner. I'm probably as intimately knowledgeable about the terrorist threat to this city as any living human being. And I am not fearful. I am aware, but I'm not going up through my life that basically changing my work habits to any great degree because of that fear. Uh, so and that's what I would encourage uh, all of you to uh, also do. Be aware, be supportive. Be alert, but let's get on with our lives and continue our lives because that's how we ultimately defeat them, where fear does not overcome us to such an extent we change our laws, we change our democratic values, that we live in fear of people who look differently than us, because if that happens, then they have won and we have lost. Okay. Thank you for that question, Your Honor. One last question, and then uh, we'll let you get back to work. And, uh, about your Could we have the uh, mic? 
One of the issues of being around those guns all those years, these ears don't hear quite as much as they used to. You commented about your relationship with the mayor. Could you please comment about the police department's relationship with the city council and what you see needs improvement in that relationship mm -hmm. and what the future holds? City council is made up of 51 individuals that uh, they are not by any means a collective body in that there are a lot of different individuals, a lot of different causes, a lot of different neighborhoods they represent, a lot of different issues. It is uh, for a police commissioner much like trying to put a Rubik's Cube together. And uh, when we get them all together, then uh, uh, that is a very rare occurrence in the sense of 51. But I think what we have been able to do over these last three years without, uh, in a sense, uh, 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 basically not having a relationship is found common ground on many issues. And some of those issues that uh, one of the things I have tried to emphasize to the council, whose role is to legislate, is that my role is to administer. And if I can get something done through policy and procedure, internally advocated and led by me, in many instances, oftentimes, that's more effective than having legislation, which puts an undue burden on the organization. And in instances where it criminalizes behavior of police officers, it acts as more of a disincentive sometimes than an incentive. So I think we've been able to find in the most, most recent series of laws that were passed by the council, after three years of very vigorous discussion and debate, common ground. I think I have my, maintained, myself and my leadership team, for our officers the tools to do their job. They have the criminal law in which they can make an arrest as a last resort but what we are encouraging that they do is to resort much more to the discretionary, discretionary powers that the law gives them and that the administrative policies of the department give them. So that tell somebody to move along. Issue a summons, not necessarily a criminal summons if you can issue a civil summons. But in all instances that an officer needs the force of law to back up his behavior. He needs to do it legally so that's where the training comes in. But he needs that force of law. And this is an issue that we have also talked with the council about. That many of them, uh, even the most liberal on the council, understand and appreciate, and the mayor certainly does, that policing and the role of government and the role of the citizen is a shared responsibility. That neither one of us or, the, or any of the entities can be more oppressive than the other that we need to find uh, mutual understanding. And one of the areas that we need to find mutual understanding is an appreciation of the law by not just the police, but the public. You cannot resist arrest. It's against the law. Yet so many of the videos that are now so commonplace, or seemingly so commonplace, because there are really not that many of them, but through social media, they shot pop up over and over and over again. I have seen repeatedly, even on our news channels, Take a close look sometimes in the first two or three minutes of a newscast. You will see an incident played five or six times during that two or three minute snippet. So the constant repetition. And the advertisers will tell you, you need to get something in front of somebody six or seven times to have it sink in. So in the media, they understand that, so they hit you six or seven times with the same image to have it sink in. But what is that showing most of the time? An individual who has begun to arrest, uh, resist an arrest, a lawful arrest, by a police officer, thus resulting in the use of force, oftentimes appropriate force, that looks awful but is lawful. You've heard me use that term. So shared responsibility, if fewer people would resist arrest, I think some of what seems to be a growing tension between police and the public uh, may in fact be put in more realistic terms. And let me close with this comment about realistic terms. Relationship with the council, I think, uh, actually is in a pretty good place uh, at this juncture compared to what everybody was anticipating three years ago. That three years ago, they were predicting Armageddon, both this new council, this new mayor, police department that was on the ropes. I think we've done pretty well. Crime is down. It has been a successful terrorist attack. Police department's better resourced than it has ever been. During Jimmy's time, they'll complete installing new bathrooms at every precinct station. Something as simple as bathrooms, clean bathrooms. Amazing, 21st century. 
Even Sir Robert Peel understood in 1829 you had to have clean station houses, but we're doing it for the first time in history. Does I have a mayor that understands the importance of something like creature comforts. But as we're going forward, the council has its role, police department has its role, but the obligation is to find common ground. And I think we have found a lot of that. But the closing comment is about the issue of your police department. We have millions of interactions with the public. 300,000 arrests a year, which are down significantly from what they were. Stop questions first this year, about 25,000 down from 700,000. Summons is down about 80,000. So as we've been enforcing broken windows, quality of life policing, we've been doing it in a less intrusive way. And I'm a great believer that if you control behavior, the basic mission of police, you can change it. You don't have as many fare evaders as when 250,000 of them, like lemmings rushing to the sea in the early 1990s, were flooding the subways. Why? We control that behavior. We brought it under control and brought it under control lawfully. So we have been reforming the department. So there is uh, the peace dividend I described of almost one million less negative enforcement actions with the public of the city, the much larger public, eight and a half million of us, in a very complex city and very complex times. So instead of constantly playing up the negativity, let's sometimes play up the positive elements of what's been going on. In a city with a very aggressive CCRB advertising, if you have a complaint, come to us. Complaints actually overall are down. And when we investigate those complaints with a reinvigorated investigative capacity at the CCRB, the majority of them are unfounded or not substantiated. So that in a city with 36,000 police officers, with millions upon millions of enforcement actions, I think we should take great pride in a city that has one of the most aggressive and transparent and available CCRBs in the country, that we have fewer than, I think, 6,000 complaints a year against New York City police officers. Instead of always focusing on the negative, celebrate some of the positives, because there are an awful lot of positives in your police department, in your NYPD. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Great to be with you. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you. Thank you all for attending. Uh, Chief O'Neill will be with us in a few weeks. I'll be getting you something soon. We'll see you next month. <laughs>